Hey guys, Shane here. So welcome to part 2 of Tamiya's M10 Tank Destroyer build. So this is in collaboration with Scale Modeling Now, which is an online model magazine and tutorial resource. So what you see before you is what we're going to get when we're finished with this tutorial. So we're going to be really covering how to paint and how to modulate US Army Olive Drab, or at least a close approximation to it. It's not entirely perfect at the shade of colour, just to get that out of the way now. I will, if I can find it, put a link into the in the description of this video of Steve Sloga's article on US World War II Olive Drab. Just in case you're one of those modelers that loves having accurate paint, for me, close enough is good enough. However, I do understand not everyone sees that way. So if I can find a, um, that article, I shall link it in the description. So we're also going to be covering how to prepare the model for the next stage of weathering, which in part 3 will be our oil weathering and our pigment weathering. We will be doing a small level of weathering such as chipping uh, in this part, which we'll see as we get into it. So let's get into it, let's get stuck in. So our model's been primed with Vallejo Surface Primer. I've given it two very thin coats and it's built it up that way. And I'm going to add the pre-shade of German Grey, in this case from Vallejo Model Air. So a pre-shade has been used by aircraft modelers for decades. It's a, a tried and tested way of creating shadow in your model. And especially since we're going to be doing a monotone olive drab paint scheme, it's going to help break up the model and just add nice and interesting color values to break up an otherwise monotoned model. So I've tinned this down with a couple of drops of, of thinner, about three or four. I don't tin them too heavily. And I'm just going to start applying this colour into areas where there are panel lines, where there are rivets, or anytime there's a recessed line, or because there's a lot of sharp angles on this tank destroyer, if it's a reverse angle, i.e. that's sloping back into the tank, and where shadow would fall naturally, I'm going to recreate the shadow, and maybe even accentuate it with the pre-shade. It is a little bit time consuming. This did take me some time to do this. However, I do find it is worth the effort. Now, I've already obviously masked our open turret top, as in part one where we painted and weathered our turret interior, as well as our hull, and I don't want to get any paint in there. So I'm gonna be quite careful that I don't get any overspray into areas I don't want, especially that turret. So make sure that you took the time to mask it correctly or you will have a hell of a time having to come back later on and paint over that. So I'm going to focus here on the grills for the engines, for these panel lines here where the fuel refueling caps on the top of the hull is, as well as any area where these tarps I've added will cast a shadow. It's also a handy way to that kind of get away if you make any mistakes later on because of this. If I have a tarp as you can see either on the hull or on the, the turret, and I miss a piece of the green, as long as I keep that in mind when I'm doing my pre-shade, I can basically make sure that there's no white primer showing through or grey primer showing through. It's just a handy little way of, of having a fail safe if you miss something. I'm not saying that that should replace you being vigilant, but sometimes we do miss things. Quick word on our, on our tarps. Um, the plastic tarps that are on the turret are basically from the Tamiya Allied um, accessory kit that I just had lying around and they're just literally glued onto the model before I primed it. And then the, the tarps on the engine deck and on the front fender are made out of milliput. I'll have a link in the description on how I make them. Very simple and just a way to add a bit of character to your model. I also made a very simple aerial recognition panel which the actual name of it eludes me. And that's actually made out of aluminium foil or kitchen foil um, or aluminium foil for our North American brethren. And that was just cut into a rectangle and then I made, cut down some Tamiya tape to make a frame around it, about one millimeter in diameter. Very simple and then just prime the model as normal. So with our pre-shade done, now I'm going to start working on our olive drab layer. So for that I'm going to start using Armour Green from Model Air. I'm going to thin this down ever so slightly, just a few drops of thinner and otherwise just straight out of the bottle. And I'm going to start edging and cutting in this colour onto our tank. 
you'll notice I'm being careful not to totally paint over or appreciate. I want that to show through in certain places. And the best way to do that is with very thin coats. Um, with a few drops of thinner, so you thin it slightly. And then you just put down very light layers. The paint becomes transparent. So it does mean that you have to do several layers to get a solid color. But if you regulate the amount of layers you do and be disciplined for your spray, you can keep that pre-shade to give the illusion of shadow. So I'm just going to be very careful and start spraying this color in. It will take me a coat or two just to get a very solid uh, base coat. But it will be worth it. Again, I'm being very mindful when I'm spraying this that there's no gaps in my masking of the open turret roof or I will hate my life and have to come back with a paintbrush and try to fix that which will be very difficult because we've already weathered our interior. The next couple of steps is we're going to be using a lot of modulation and panel fades to create interest. Otherwise, it'll be monotone and boring. It's not the most realistic in the world. Tanks don't look this way in real life. However, in scale, we have to over-exaggerate light values. Otherwise, the model looks flat or looks like a toy. So that's how we get around that. So I'm going to make sure we have a nice even coat of this. We'll appreciate showing true in places. And now we're going to start working on our highlights. So I'm going to take some armor green and yellow ochre and I'm going to mix them roughly 70 to 30 with our armor green being our dominant color and the ochre will just make it look a bit more olivey and you'll notice here I'm going to start spraying this into the center of panels but if you look at the motion in which I'm spraying I'm spraying in an up down motion I never come from left to right it's always up and down almost like I'm doing a noil dot filter and what I'm trying to replicate is the sun the elements lightening the paint. It also helps to break up and add interest to our model as well as help showcase the shape of our model. This is a very good model. I keep saying model. This is a very good like subject matter for panel fading. For a simple fact being is there's a lot of flat sides an M10 tank destroyer just like the other um, um, Sherman chassis that have welded hulls. There's a lot of flat, um, sharp angles that we can experiment with. Um, so this will look really, this is the best type of test place really to experiment and play with panel fades. And I'm really focusing too on the top of the tank, really focusing on the turret roof, the tops of the counterweights at the back of the turret, the engine deck. I'm not going to be adding much highlights to the lower hull or the lower glacis because naturally shadow is going to be falling there and that's where I focus most of our appreciated almost painting that entire area panzer grey and because of the light and the dark base coats that we're applying these colors on it does give us different values so you can see here how I'm cutting in the center of these panels I leave the edges in the darker color and then just apply our, our lighter color to the center of these panels. And it just helps break things up. As you can see, even though there's a slight satin quality to the paints I'm using, that's why the camera's iris makes it look a bit darker than it actually is. But even with that, you can see how the various angles and shapes of this tank immediately, or should I say tank destroyer before you correct me, immediately pop. And it's a very simple way of doing it. It's not difficult. Just keep your paint thin, keep your model moving, short bursts of paint. Do not allow it to build up on one, any one area. Thin coats are your friend. Uh, if you have to practice with your airbrush with a piece of card, then by all means, I would recommend using paper card rather than plastic unless you prime the plastic beforehand. Or the paint will actually run off plastic card if you don't. Now we're going to add another layer of highlights. Again, I'm going to take our olive drab, or not olive drab, our yellow ochre, should I say, and I'm going to mix it into our pre-existing mixture, roughly going for a 50-50 armor green yellow ochre mixture. So we're going to give it a lighter color. So I always find is go for a kind of safe or neutral highlight ratio for the first layer of highlighting, 
with the darker color being the dominant and slowly work it up in progressive layers gives you more control so you can see here this lighter color i've been very careful i'm focusing really just on the top of the tank and again the same principle i'm only spraying it into the center of panels and this feather out again center the panel and leave it at that i'll do it on the top of the gun barrel in places too just to get again make it pop out a bit i've been very careful not to overdo this i don't want to completely undo all the layers of paint so i'm really like focusing on raised details on this just things to make make things uh, make various features and details of this model pop it just helps bring a bit of character to it so now i'm going to start painting in the tops of these fenders for example Now again, the camera is struggling to pick this up because of the glossy finish or the satin finish. However, anytime you see me move the model, you can see how things kind of pop. And again, I'm doing that kind of streaking up down airbrush motion. I'm not spraying across the model. I'm picking from the top and working down. And again, it's replicating that this tank has been out in the sun. It has been caught in rainstorms. It has been out in the field for extended periods of time. The fecal we're going for is going to be a 1944, late 44, early 45 fecal, kind of around the time of the Horton Forest and the breakout from that area. So it's going to be in the field for almost a year at that point if it landed in Normandy. So it's going to be pretty battered and worn. So with our pre, not our pre shades, with our highlight layers allowed to dry, now I'm going to apply some gloss uh, varnish in preparation for the decals. Now, there's a few things to bear in mind. Now, we covered how to decal a model in our beginner series. So again, if you go through my video library or if you're on Scale Modeling Now, go through their technique bank and see can you find it. It's there somewhere. So I'm going to really go through this very quickly as I'm not going to cover the same ground twice. There's no need. However, one thing to bear in mind, and this came back to bite me and... There was no excuse, I just kind of got in the zone and I wanted to get into it quick. When I was spraying this layer, it was immensely humid here in Ireland. It was very, very humid. It was about 19, 20 degrees with high humidity. And because there was so much humidity and moisture in the air, the gloss coat did not fully dry. It was a bit tacky to the touch. And, you know, I got a bit impatient and I shouldn't have. And what happens is the gloss coat begins to literally stick to the decal and glue it in place. So I had to go back, apply a new coat uh, after I ate up a couple of tactical markings on this fecal. So that's why the uh, lower glacis serial number is basically in pieces. It broke apart. However, I managed to realize what was happening before I played, uh, placed this uh, allied star. So now what I'm doing with our decal here is I'm taking some microsol which is a decal softener and I'm painting it onto both the surface of the model and then on top of the and then actually the surface of the decal and then I'm going to use a very soft brush to bed that down I want it to sit I don't want any air underneath the model or underneath the decal should I say I don't want any wrinkles or creasing and it's going to be very gentle and just crease out any of these uh, wrinkles or any uh, creases on our decal. I do find that sometimes using something like a, a sponge is really advantageous to bed a, mod a decal onto a model surface without breaking it. So with that, with our decals out of the way, or with our decals allowed to set, now it's time to seal them. So I'm just going to take some gloss varnish and I'm just going to apply with a paintbrush. There's no, no need to break out the airbrush again. And I'm just going to paint over our decals with a few layers, with a few um, light layers of gloss varnish. Again, I'm going to be very careful to make sure there's no brush strokes. So I'm, make, I'm going to make sure I blend them in correctly. And the reason why we lay a gloss coat before and after our decals is one, the gloss breaks the surface tension of the paint. So it gives almost like a glass-like um, surface to lay our decal on. It helps it conform to the model a bit better. Also, because of the carrier film that decals have, have a slight glossy quality to them, it helps reduce the danger of silvering. These steps are very handy. So if you're having trouble with your decals that keep silvering and you haven't been using gloss either um, before and after, you work with your decals, that could be it. So with our decals set aside, 
we're going to start working on some other details here over M10. And we're going to be working with our buggies, our Fifi SS buggies. And I'm going to start painting in the rubbers of the tires with some German grey. Again, I've left these as sub-assemblies, just glued, super glued them to some cocktail skewers, just to make life easier. You could glue them to the model if you want. I've done so in the past, but it makes life very difficult to try to paint these things if you have them in place. So best just to keep them as sub-assemblies. Make your life as easy as you can, guys. Don't, don't overcomplicate model making. You're meant to enjoy it after all. On looking back on this, I really should have used a more finely tipped brush for painting in the rims here. Um, you'll see me having to come back and wipe away the panzer grey any time I get it over an area that it shouldn't be. But the handy thing is I can just rub it away before it dries. But uh, a more finely pointed brush would have been more advantageous, I find. But I was in the zone, like the rest of us, and just wanted to power through it. So again, you no, know, use your brushes. Uh, for the best job you know different there are tools after all and different brushes do different jobs with different levels of success so like using a wide bristle brush like i'm doing here to paint the the bulk of the the wheels is perfect and then i should have switched down to a more finely bristle brush to paint the the rims uh, at the front of the wheels rather than what i'm trying to do here so <laughs> Again, I got away with it, but if you guys are a little bit unsure or you're, you're new to it, best to switch down to a more finely bristle brush. One thing I, I should mention while we're here before I forget is I painted uh, the buggies and the running gear the exact same way as I painted the upper hull. The only difference is I did not highlight them to the same level. I basically applied the first highlight with just a small amount of yellow ochre into our armor green mixture and just left it at that. I don't want to over highlight these things. These are going to get a lot of attention from our oil weathering so there's no point in making it too bright. After all, these are going to be quite dusty and muddy when we're done with them. So we're going to add some metal chipping to our dry sprockets and I'm just going to take some, a piece of sponge and some Vallejo gun metal. I'm just going to uh, add some bare metal to the top of the teeth of each sprocket. It's a very simple detail but it does add a little bit of um, extra interest and when we come to weather our sprockets we'll tone that back uh, so it won't be as stark. But the sponge is probably the best means. You could brush paint this too, but the sponge gives us a very randomized effect. So it's just a nice little detail to add to your, your armor. Okay, so now I'm going to start adding some of the more um, metallic areas, such as return rollers. So I'm going to take some metallic black from Model Air and some gunmetal, again from Model Air. And I'm going to mix them together to make a very dark iron-like color. What I find with the gunmetal from Model Air, it's too silvery, it's too bright. So you could either mix flat black, or in this case, metallic black, to create this kind of irony color. <laughs> irony, I know. Uh, I just created a new word, I'm running with it now. And I'm just gonna start painting this into the suspension for the Falute suspension springs, as well as the return rollers on the buggies. I don't want this to be too bright. After all, uh, we're gonna be weathering these down quite a bit, so I might as well just give them a nice subdued uh, metallic base coat. And again, I'm going to be kind of careful not to get this color anywhere we don't want it. 
The problem with metallic paints, as I always say, if you paint and get a bit of over paint or over spray onto an area, even if you wipe it away, you're going to be left with metallic speckles on the area that you wipe them from. So it's, you're going to have, literally have to go back with your base coat and paint over it. Uh, due to the fact that most metallic colours have metal flakes in them, like microscopic metal flakes, that gives them their metallic sheen. And if you get that old, like paint into an area that you do not want, it's going to be, you're going to literally have to go up, come back and paint over it. So best to save yourself a bit of hassle and just be careful. As you can see, I've switched down to a very fine bristle of brush here. And I'm just going to paint that in. It does take about two coats per return roller to get an even coat. Another detail we're going to paint in is the metal finish on our idler, or is that our return roller? It's idler is our yeah, it's our idler. Uh, I can't believe for, I forgot the name of that. That's a, a thing a lot of people make mistakes with with Sherman's and Sherman chassis. Is when it's a Fifi SS suspension, they tend to paint these like rubber black, which is not true. Um, on the Fifi SS, these were uh, metallic; they were bare metal. On the HVSS, basically the type of suspension that Fury has, they're rubberized idlers. So just a little thing to keep in mind if you're working on Sherman's or Sherman chassis. Also going to take this color and paint in some of the uh, spare track. I think these are either cleats or they're the actual metal spines of the track links. It's one or the other. And I'm going to start painting these in very carefully. Again, I'm just going to fire through these. Just going to get them out of the way since I have the colour um, ready to go. I won't be painting the tools in this step, nor any of the stowage as I, as I mentioned earlier. And the reason for that is quite simple, is I'm going to be doing a lot of dot filters and panel washes. And if I paint in our, our base coat, or at least even base coat, our tools and stowage, I'm going to have to keep coming back in with Q-tips to wash away any of the panel washes and oil washes that I don't want there. So it's just easy to leave that part off until we actually do the actual pigment weathering. So I'll do the oils. So I'll do the oils first and then I'll come back and I'll paint up the um, various stowage and tools and then we'll do the pigments. That's how, how I'm going to do this. Sometimes it's just a bit of pre-thinking and a pre-planning on, on your part can make life a bit easier and that's what I'm doing here. You can also see some of the panel um, highlights that we've done. It's quite subtle and that's good. We wanted to keep it subtle. I don't want it to be too stark as tanks aren't, they don't weather the way we weather in real life and I don't want to make it look like a science fiction fake. You can do it that way if you like it. Again, it's your aesthetic quality that you're really modeling to, you know. You have to be kind of, you have to like what you're doing. So if you want to make them really stark and really sharp edge highlights, by all means, go for it. It's really just down to what your aesthetic quality and your aesthetic taste is. But for me, I like to keep them somewhat subtle. Okay, so I'm going to add some chips now to our model. And again, the glossy coats are going to make it a little bit hard to see. Again, I'm sorry for that. It's just the gloss is bouncing light back into the iris, iris of my camera. Um, and so it's kind of making it very difficult to see. But I'm just going to take some... German camo black brown. Exactly the same colour we used for the interior of our fecal, which you can see now since I've removed our turret. And I'm just going to start working this into any of the sharp angles, any area where the crew might be walking, the front fenders. And the nice thing is this model more or less shows you where to put the chips. For the simple fact being is there's a lot of sharp angles and basically just work some chips into any of these sharp angles as these would get wear and tear, they would get friction and I'm just working that in and as you can see here if I don't like it I just wipe it away immediately with my finger and that's also the um, another advantage of the gloss because it's so smooth if you just wipe it straight away it's gone and you can just start again it, it's so simple and I'm just using a piece of packing foam here and I'm just working my way around I'm being somewhat random you know I don't uh, I'm not really thinking about it too much I'm just kind of going it's a sharp angle does it make sense for it to be there? Yeah, fair enough. I'm not putting too many chips like at the center of panels, just a, a very, very subtle a, a layer of chipping at the center of panels because it'd be too stark and it'll get messy, you know? I'm really just focusing on sharp angles for the most part. Same here with the turret. Again, on the turret roof. Areas I feel that would be in friction from the crew walking around or just 
um, foreign objects just rubbing against it, whether it be like branches if it's going through a forest or what have you. And again, I'm sorry it's a little bit hard to see, it's just uh, the light qualities are a bit mental. <laughs> Again, just like the backs of the counterweights for the turret and the edge of the gun mantlets. As simple as that. You can go as crazy or as subdued with this as you wish. And I'm going to do this now before I do any of the oils because the oils are going to uh, blend all this together. I'm also going to add another layer of chipping. I'm going to take just some straight up uh, Vallejo gun metal. I haven't mixed any of the darker colour into it. And I'm going to paint in some metallic, like bare metal into some of these chips. I'm not going to do it to all of them, but just some of the more sharper edges where even the primer has been exposed to the metal underneath. I would recommend that less is very much more with this. Don't go too mad with this. Also, you could use the same technique for darkening down. You could add a bit of metallic black or just flat black to your colour to darken it if you find this is too bright. But bear in mind, we are going to be putting oil layers above this. Uh, in the next step or the next episode of this uh, of this build so it's going to be all toned back and pulled together so just keep that in mind especially too if you're getting nervous as you're doing this going oh this is too stark we are going to be toning all this together with our oil layers again i'm just focusing on these sharp edges especially on the uh, front mud flaps here like the fender uh, mud guards they're going to get beaten up quite a bit I'm just using a very fine brush, I'm just like cutting that in. I'm leaving the um, camo black brown around the edges. Again, because it just adds a bit of context, you know, I'm not going to paint them into areas I haven't chipped. You can see that it catches the light and it's subtle, it doesn't have to be too stark. Just edge highlighting these in, same here with the uh, the sharp corners here of the uh, front glazes plate. And like I said, you can be as bold or as subtle with this as you wish. It's totally up to you. I do normally give the hatches quite a bit of attention because they will be probably have the most amount of wear and tear just from the crew uh, just closing the hatch several times every day. You know, it's, it's one of those things. Again, I'm just going to put a bit more bare metal here to maybe replicate where the crewmen step in and out of the hatch. Now we're going to move on to the part I hate the most, which is tracks. I don't know why, I just do not like painting tracks. I'm just going to make up my own kind of track primer. So I'm going to take some German grey. I'm going to take some light brown and I'm also going to take some, uh, what's it, oh my god, brown grey and a little bit of uh, burnt umber to give it a bit of a metallic thing, uh, fix to it. The, pr the main colour that we want is going to be the grey because these are a rubber based track. Again, I can never remember what type of track these are and I should know that being the Sherman guy but we're all human and dear god are there so many track types for the Sherman it's not even funny to keep up with them but because the main color is going to be like a, a rubber like color but I want them to be a bit like you know beaten up and aged and weathered I'm just going to make sure that the, the main color of this mixture is kind of like a, 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 a dark gray if you will make it look kind of rubbery and then I just added some um, light browns into that mix and then a little bit of uh, burnt umber to give it a maybe a slightly kind of rust like a, appearance but subtle only a tiny amount you could just use track primer for this um it's the same color basically so now to do the metal guide rings we're going to do a bit of dry brushing so I'm just going to take some oily steel from Model Color. I'm going to use a cut down brush. It's an old brush. I just cut the bristles off. And I'm going to just take a piece of kitchen roll, rub off about 80% of the, or 90% of the color. And I'm just going to basically focus this into the guide teeth. Once again, you can see it's subtle, but you can kind of see that the metallics are already beginning to catch. 
I'm not going to go too crazy doing this because the tracks are going to get very heavily weathered. But I just want to give the impression that these are metallic. I'm going to be careful not to get them onto the, the rubber uh, treads of these tracks though. And the advantage of dry brushing here is just that only the most like raised details will get the, the paint layer. So it won't be too stark and basically it's actually how tracks behave in real life. I'm also catching the tops of the tracks on the inside, as in the teeth, just as you can see, like the inner teeth. I'm just catching the tops of them, just to make sure that they get a bit of weathering too, so people can see that. It's not the most exciting step in the world, but it does add a lot. And now just to add a bit of weathering to the actual rubber treads of the track. And this is actually a technique I saw, I've learned from Adam Wilder. Uh, I kind of want to show that the, the the rubber pads are in friction, so I'm just going to take some German grey and stipple it on using uh, a sponge, just to make it look like uh, this rubber has been kind of worn and it's it's still in use from friction with the ground. I might be better off using flat black, but I just didn't have any of the hand. As you can kind of see, it gets a bit of a texture. And it just makes my tracks look a bit more worn. Now, you're not going to probably see any of this once we weather them up with pigments. But it's always good just to know, add these extra layers. Because if you can see it, it will add more to it. If you can't, well, not to worry. But best not, best not to skimp any attention on the tracks. And if I had to do it, so are you. Because I hate doing tracks. God, I hate them. I don't mind building them, but I absolutely hate painting them. It's just one of those things that annoy me for some reason. So with our stippling done, we're just going to add a little bit of a wash of Agrat's Earthshade into our uh, track teat, or our, our metal guide teat basically. I'm just going to apply this wash pretty roughly, I, I don't really mind um, if it's a little bit heavy in places. And that's just to give a, a sense of grease and grime. And that's all I'm going to do because the next couple of steps are going to be all pigment driven and uh, mud driven. So there's no point uh, going too crazy adding a lot of detail to these tracks because a lot of them are going to be under a layer of mud anyway. So again, keep that in mind when you're doing your projects. There's no point putting 10 hours of work into a set of tracks that you're going to completely obscure with a layer of mud. <laughs> it's kind of, it's counter, it's counterproductive, counterintuitive. And once our tracks have gotten their wash on both sides, that is this episode completely wrapped up. So I hope you found this episode interesting, at least give you some ideas on how to work with olive drab, and at least how I paint it. I will try to track down that article so you guys can see the, a more accurate version of the colour shade, um, if I can find that is. If not, I'm sorry. So I really hope you guys join me in part three, where we're, where we're going to be focusing on the oil weathering and pigments. It's going to be really exciting. We're going to really make this tank look battered and battle worn and a lot of mud. It's going to be probably one of the dirtiest tanks we're going to do because I have an idea what I want to do with this. So thank you so much for listening to me harp on and rabble for the last 30 odd minutes. Uh, do join me in part three. Uh, as always, guys, have fun. If you have any comments, please just... Uh, Ask them in the comments and I'll be happy to help you out any way I can. I've been Shane. Happy modeling as always, my friends. And I'll catch you in the next video. Bye-bye.